people are joining, we wait a couple of seconds. Okay, I guess we, um, I guess we can start. Um, so welcome to everybody. I'm, um, I'm Ugo Panizza and I'm uh, here to chair the presentation of the first CPR long-term investment report titled When the Tailwind Stop, the private equity industry and the, in the new interest rate environment. So I guess I'm here at the intersection of three roles. The one role as um, vice president of CEPR, another role as a member of the scientific committee of a long-term investor at the uh, University of Torino. And I guess it, the third role is that um, I am part of the Geneva report, which was the first report jointly created between a, a think tank and, and CEPR and now and the, and the uh, long-term investor report is the third to join the family after the, the, the Geneva report and the Barcelona report. So I'm very happy to be here for, for the launch of the first report. Um, so I'm gonna give the floor to, to Pietro Garibaldi, who is my boss in a sense, because he's the, he's the director of the long-term investor at the University of Torino. So I, I, I serve at, at his pleasure. So, so Pietro will say something about the the report. Pietro, the floor is yours. Oh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, so my, my voice is not perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Hugo. Actually, um, of course, as uh, vice president of CPR, I'm one of your fellows. So <laughs> you are my ultimate boss. Uh, so anyway, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here as director of LTI. Let me just give you a few words. Uh, LTI is a, um, is a think tank established in 2017 at the University of Torino. It's called Long-Term Investor at UNITO, and it's part of the activity of Collegio Carlo Alberto. And it exists thanks to the initiative of the University of Torino, but also it uh, um, exists through the support, continuing support of key um, uh, financial uh, institutions in North Italy and uh, uh, all, all that we do, it's thanks to these uh, generous contributions. So let me remind Compagnia di San Paolo, Equita, Intesa San Paolo, Fonda, Covercel, Reale Mutua, and Banor. So that's the set of investors let us uh, um, do this interest activity, which is a focus on long-term investment. So I think uh, one of the strengths, if anyone, of this uh, um, young institution is that it's focus uh, on a subset of the world of finance, which is long-term investment. Now, I um, became director in 2020, and one of the things that I uh, thought about it in order to basically to, <clears throat> to reach our goal of uh, basically disseminating high-quality research was to uh, establish um, a long-term investment report. And uh, as part of this activity, in fact, I, um, I remember also asking Hugo to join the um, scientific committee. We have a, a distinguished scientific committee, which is chaired by uh, Jean-Charles Rocher and, uh, um, and many distinguished scholars. So one of the first uh, activities, uh, ideas was uh, mm, uh, to do something in line uh, with uh, basically the, the well-known Geneva reports that Hugo was mentioning and calling the uh, LTI report. So, and uh, it's asking to top scholars uh, working on, in the field to contribute to uh, doing the report and of course, disseminating their own uh, research. So that was the idea of the uh, LTI report. And um, when we, and start thinking about it. it was basically the end of 2020, uh, also with the help of another uh, person in our scientific board, which is Francesca Cornelli, we thought that the ideal 
person of thinking of the long-term investment world in a world of low uh, interest rate was uh, um, Victoria uh, Ivashizna and was the first uh, uh, person we asked for the first report. And uh, remarkably, uh, she accepted and that we were very uh, proud and eager that uh, she accepted. And, uh, um, and we were together last year, of course, she, uh, I was as director of LTI and she wrote the report. It was then presented uh, at the Torino uh, conference and now we are launching the, uh, the, the digital and physical report uh, today. So it's a very particular day. Let me just uh, give you this very few words of uh, who is Victoria. Victoria is a distinguished scholar, you all know her. She doesn't need much of an, of an introduction. She's the loved learned professor of finance and head of the finance unit at Harvard Business School. She's a, a research fellow, not only of CPR, but also of the National Bureau of Economic Research. And she's also co-head of the Harvard Business School Private Capital Initiative and Private Equity and Venture Capital. She has published extensively in, uh, um, in, in top finance journal and economic journals. And she's also now working at the border between finance and macro, which is partly of what uh, she will be uh, telling us about in basically in this uh, very timely and interesting report uh, on, on the link between the long-term investment and private equity industry and um, a, a declining interest rate, which is bound to finish in the years to come. So that in some sense is extremely timely beyond uh, very nice. So um, I also thanks a lot CPR, which of course accepted to, <clears throat> to be uh, a joint partner in this uh, nice uh, first, hopefully a long series of uh, LTI report. So I don't have much of a voice, but I think it's much better to hear from, uh, from Victoria. So I would uh, give back the floor to Hugo that uh, probably will pass it on to Victoria. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so I, I don't need to do much because uh, Pietro already introduced Victoria. So the plan is that uh, Victoria will, will present the report for about 25 minutes. Um, we were supposed to have two discussions. One, um, Pietro mentioned Francesca Cornelli, who is the uh, Dean uh, of the Kellogg School of Northwestern and also a, a, a top finance researcher like Victoria. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Francesca cannot be with us today, so she sends her apologies. But we are happy that we have uh, uh, Gilles Moek, uh, who is, today is a complicated day for everybody who's in the market, so I doubly appreciate uh, his, his ability to be with us today. Uh, Gilles is the uh, chief economist of the AXA group and uh, also the, the head of research and uh, you know, he has many responsibilities, also uh, supervising uh, responsible investment and so on and so forth. So Gilles will, uh, will, uh, will comment on, uh, for about 10, 12 minutes on, on Victoria's presentation, and then we will have some time for, for Q&A. You can start from now to, you can use the Q&A uh, function to, to send your questions and then I, I'll pick them up and then uh, you know, direct them to, to Victoria or even to Gilles if you want. So, uh, Victoria, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, thank you, Hugo, and thank you, Pietro. And Jill, I look forward to your comments. Uh, Hugo, could you confirm that you see the right slide here? Yes, looks good. Yes, right. good. All right. So, first of all, uh, I truly appreciate this opportunity. I think uh, it's a great subject and uh, it was an honor to be invited to write this report. The broader topic when we started was uh, to think about monetary policy or interest rates and uh, private equity industry. And there are two things going on. One is the one that we know very well. Uh, a significant segment of private equity industry, which is buyouts, depend on availability of credit. So not surprisingly, there is within cycle, within credit cycle dynamic of the private equity industry, specifically buyouts that we've known before. What this report is about is about something slightly different. And it's specifically about the long-term trend in interest rates. So if you look at this picture, this is a picture we all know. This is, of course, looking at the US treasuries, but a similar uh, picture can be uh, produced for uh, Europe as well. It has been well known that 
for 40 years have been a secular, so-called secular decline of interest rates. And another important observation here is that around the global financial crisis, we hit the so-called zero lower band. And since then, a substantial amount of research has been produced that kind of points out to the fact that it is not easy to go below zero low band. And so that is somewhat of a hard constraint for uh, for nominal interest rates. Now, there is an important observation in that you could say, wait a second, we are looking at nominal interest rates, but they what limited partners, what investors in private equity industry care about our real interest rate. Indeed, uh, a lot of pension funds have uh, adjustments in the promised returns that reflect the inflation rate. But the reality is that the real interest rates has not been very disconnected from the nominal interest rate in the recent times. And it's very unlikely that if nominal interest rate is stuck eh, around zero, that the real interest rate uh, will diverge substantially. So all in all, I will continue about uh, talking about interest rates. And uh, what I mean here is this trend. And the fact that if you look forward, then it is pretty clear from this picture that this trend is over. So the 40 years of the declining rate has ended. And of course, then there is a question of, does it stay flat in the longer run and lingers around the way it lingered around in the past 10 years? Or is there something else here? Uh, or will it start shooting up? I'll put that conversation aside, as that's a com complex conversation, how fast and how permanent we expect interest rate to escalate. But the worst, the most rosy scenario here is that there will be no longer continuous decline in interest rate. Meanwhile, if you think about the history of the private equity, then this, this 40 years coincide with a very with the rise of the uh, fundraising in the industry. Now, another clarifying point that I want to make here is that by private equity, I will be broadly speaking about multiple strategies that are deployed through the fund structure. Again, not direct investments in the private, uh, uh, in the private side, but fund uh, investments. And this will include not only buyouts, but also venture capital, gross equity. And if you wish, it could also include private debt as well. All right, so uh, the core idea here is that if you think about this rise of the private equity in uh, asset class, which evolved over the 40 years, the co-drivers behind its evolution will be one, supply of capital and the growth of long-term pools of capital, right? So migration from defined benefit to defined contribution and pension fund area, emergence of the sovereign wealth funds and more formal uh, management of endowments, et cetera. The other thing is, of course, the maturity of an asset class. It's been many years since this has been described as barbarians at the gates, and this is a mature industry now with many mature practices. And familiarity with an asset class, familiarity, distinction between among the strategies and within the fund industry kind of helps to deploy capital towards this asset class. But importantly, declining interest rate environment has been something that helped despite maybe not the best signals from the industry to continuously push capital into the industry and especially over the past uh, 10 to 15 years. Now, with that in mind, uh, as I already said, the next several decades will be characterized at the very least uh, by lingering interest rates around zero. So there is no longer the declining trend in interest rates and possibly a rise, a more permanent rise in interest, uh, uh, in interest rate. And that creates an adverse adjustment for uh, the dynamic that drives the growth of private equity. Now, uh, in what follows, have, and this is how the report is structured, I will reflect about the following, following points. One is, why is this connection between interest rate environment and flattening of interest rate environment or potential reversal and private equity growth is so hard to see. Why are we not talking about it? The second point will be 
what does it all mean for limited partners? And limited partners here are investors in the private equity. For example, pension fund are the largest limited partner group in the private equity industry. And finally, what if anything can offset this negative trend? And we'll reflect about that. So first of all, let's think about the flattening of growth and inter uh, of interest rate and how to connect it to industry growth. And why is it not so easy? And think about what are we hearing on the background. Of course, there have been abundant news that we are at the peak of the fundraising in the private equity. It's a very popular asset class, and it's also we are also at the peak of the expansion of allocation toward private equity. If you look at the publicly traded funds, they are they've been trading uh, incredibly successfully. Here's another cut of looking at the same. If you look at the surveys that think about I limited partners likely to allocate money toward private equity asset class, focus on the second line, which is buyouts essentially. Over 40% expect, expect to expand the allocation toward the asset class. So everything points out to the fact that this is a very popular asset class. So now if you tie it up with the fact that the interest rates actually hit the zero in 2008, then it's very hard to connect those two things because it's been over a decade that we've been sitting on the negative rate and we're experiencing the boom in the past couple of years. So how comes the two can possibly be connected? And I think that part of what kind of stands in our way to connecting those things is the fact that we generally Every other asset class has a dynamic that connects much quicker the changes in interest rate environment and the flow of capital. And so in here, not only they seem to go in the opposite order, they also very, very disconnected in time. So if we would be talking about mutual fund industry, for example, that would, be, that would develop much quicker. So what's going on in the private equity? And there are some supply factors, there are some demand factors. So first, of course, private equity, fund, fund private equity, uh, is race funded through closed at end funds with the average life of about 10 years that are raised in overlapping way, right? So roughly year five into your fund four, you will be considering right, raising your fund five and so on and so forth. So on the supply side, if I'm a pension fund who wants to invest in private equity on the supply, on the fund side, well, first, funds are not raised continuously. If I want to dial my private equity, well, that's not how this works. Public assets work this way. The private assets, I have to time when the funds become available. Access to a fund is not guaranteed. Uh, Moreover, the biggest problem perhaps is the fact that it's an illiquid asset class. So by the time the next fund is raised, I probably don't have much information about the performance of the previous fund. And therefore for me to adjust my location to the next fund, I don't have much information on that. So what will happen is that commitments to private equity have this slow momentum that that plays out over a life of at least two fonts. It's only by the end of a decade that you start having information about performance of the previous fonts that you will likely to act on. Now, the other thing is that on the demand side, as a pension fund, if I'm going to enter into private equity, there is also a benefit to entering to it in, on a scale. Entering just dipping your toes into private equity is very hard because it's a small check that I need internal infrastructure that uh, allows me to manage an asset class that is very different from a public asset class. So typically what happens, and that also kind of alters the way we think about the dynamic of entry and exit uh, of capital from this industry, is that when capital flows into the industry, it tends to flow very, very actively because people intend to invest in this, uh, in this asset class on a scale. So let's look at what we see in here. And this is from some of my previous research. We're looking at uh, pension funds investment around the world 
between 2017 and 2008, so 10 years. And we're doing some very simple exercise. We are taking fraction of their AUM invested in private equity, broadly speaking, in 2008. And then we're going in 2017 and measuring the same number and just dividing one by the other. So let me give you an example. If your private equity allocation was about 5% in 2008, and by 2017, it's 10% of AU asset under management, then you doubled your allocation. So it will be a two on the vertical axis. So what do we see here? Well, first of all, nobody's shrinking. <laughs> Second is that significant fraction of countries, and notice that here I'm observing many pension funds within a country, and I'm taking averages of pension fund behavior across in a given country and just plotting this free. What we see is that in a range of countries over this period, uh, the allocation to private equity increased by 1.5 and for many, over two times the allocation in private equity. So this is a kind of in line with the fact that there is this push. And notice the date here is 2008. We are comparing us to 2008, precisely when the interest rate hit, uh, hit, this, hit zero in the context of global financial crisis. So this is in line with, with the logic that I'm suggesting, that we are, it's a cycle that work over a very long period of time, and they are jump started by something that is like 2008 and the fact that it hit, uh, hit uh, zero lower by. So in sum, the best way to think about the industry here and the way it reacts to interest rate environment is a phrase that is often used in the industry. It's a, anything in private equity is a the changing the trends in the private equity is like turning the oil tanker. And unlike in any other financial market, this relationship has to be sought over a very long period of time. And the best way to understand the industry is to think about these waves that start decades ago and take time to unravel. What we observe today is still comes on the tail of the strategic shifts in allocations that pension funds took after the financial crisis. It was in response to the financial crisis, it was in the response to zero lower bound that many pension funds decided to dial up the allocation of pension funds, but that dialing up and updating on that strategy is something that is very slowly moving. All right, let's say that I convinced you that this, what we see today is an effect of something that actually happened a while ago. And unavoidably, it will wear itself down, especially given that, the, uh, that that pressure of pushing the capital into the industries that might deliver a slightly higher return is no longer there, given that the interest rates are flattened out. So what will it mean? Well, first of all, let's acknowledge the fact that we are in the industry that has faced competitive pressures for quite a while, right? I mean, with the rise of the industry, with the growth of the industry, not surprisingly, the competition has increased. And there have been a lot of the debate of the performance of the industry. Uh, I think that the accurate reflection of that is that it is a solid asset class and the returns have been modest. And then when you start thinking about top quartiles, bottom quartiles, that's where kind of uh, the, the granularity uh, of uh, the debate is. Now, so the returns have already been substantially compressed as a result of competition. So what is at stake? Because whenever there is slowdown of capital flow, the question is what will be at stake? And what is at stake is that the result of this pressure is likely to push around the way the economics of fees are distributed. And fees being one of the frontiers of the private equity industry that's not been uh, moving fast enough. And first point is that uh, there is significant operational leverage in this industry. If you're comparing an 8 billion fund to 1 billion fund, well, I mean, you're not doing eight, eight times more deals. You're not hiring eight times more people. That's a very simple and uh, way to put it. Of course, if 
there is the numbers also can start get shocking, right? Because if you get 20 billion funds and very quickly you get to 1.5 billion in fees in five first five years alone. And of course, the industry is pushing for some of the largest firms to 30 billion per fund at this point. And that is on main strategies. If you think across different strategies across platform, that those numbers of asset under management escalate. The other problem, of course, is that when the fund scales up, there is a misalignment of incentives because fees, even if they compress a little, if it's even they go from 2% to 1.5%, the problem is that fees are start dominating the way the firm, the way uh, the invest the inflow of capital to investment professionals because carry is uh, not necessarily increasing. In fact, as more capital is deployed, the returns are likely to get compressed, so carry likely to get compressed, whereas the fees are, uh, are staying flat. So this, this misalignment of economics of larger mega funds being heavily compensated of the fees as opposed to the carry is something that, that is uh, not uh, ideal in the industry. Finally, needless to say, the fees are certain, right? Which is one of the important critiques of the, of the industry. They're not performance dependent and they go up front. So with that in mind, uh, there are many people before them, before me, that raised an issue about fees and fees being something that has been slow to uh, move in the industry. There are additional factors you have to think about that go beyond today's talk. I touch upon them or the report. I'm not going to go into them here because not only the general partners, not only the fund industry takes the blame here. A lot of it actually sits on the limited partners and the fact of how the, in the industry dynamic works. So in when we... So my point here is that what at stake is compression, finally the compression of the fees. But it's not to be taken for granted because there is a slow dynamic on the limited partner side, how to think about this. One additional point to add to that is the fact that a consolidation of the industry is something that might contribute to the fact that it slows the dynamic of the fee, fee, uh, fee erosion. So on the, on the general performance, I think that uh, it delivers what the competitive industry should. Competition will continue to be significant, uh, a significant contributor uh, of how we think about performance in this industry. But it's really uh, fees which are substantial that uh, are at stake and, and can be uh, and should and can be affected in this context. All right, let's think about the offsetting dynamic because even if they, we take out the interest rates, the industry is not going to stay flat, right? The, if we talk, we have this conversation 10 years later, we know that the industry that will shrink, will grow, something will happen to it, and regardless of the macroeconomic trend. So what are the important forces behind it? And importantly, is there something that the industry can do proactively to upset this negative trend? And my impression is that many people in the industry are well aware of it. My impression as well is that the industry is a very smart industry. It is a very creative industry. And, uh, and I think that uh, there, if we should have a serious conversation about what possible initiatives are there that can allow to keep the flow of capital into the, into, into the SAS economy. So let's do the following. Let's divide our... Uh, anything that the core forces on the background in, in this matrix. First of all, there are things that will affect on, that, that will affect capital flow negatively, such as flattening of inter interest rates. And there are things that we can expect the flow of capital positively. And then we can divide them in those that are just macro factors. So development outside of the industry and we can think about uh, factors that are directly influenced by private, by private equity. Of course, the industry will not do anything to compress itself, which is why one of the quadrants here is taken out. 
All right, well, let's summarize what the report has to say. And here, I'm not gonna dive too deeply into any of that just for sake of time, but this is why the report will be diving and evaluating this, this issues. So the point of the report is that the interest rate environment kind of went from this bottom, which was what was pushing capital to expand for the industry into the top in that it's no longer a factor. It's a, the interest rates will be flat at best. If it increases and it becomes a strong negative factor for the industry. Of course, uh, regulation is something, perhaps I should have not put it as something, uh, uh, a, I mean, partly it's affected by the industry, but regulation is another important factor that kind of plays with interest rates because higher transparency on the fees, which is a proposal under the consideration in the United States will be something that accelerate the points that I'm raising here. There are other things to consider. I already touched upon competition, which I think largely played out already. It will always continue to be there, but I think that the industry today is fairly competitive as it is. And evolution of P performance, of how we think about it, evolution of the liquidity and measurement, that thing can cut both ways. Now, as to what industry can do, there are two important trends that I think one has to consider that will contribute to inflow of capital to the industry. One is ability to reach for capital that is outside of the traditional LP base. So traditionally pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, endowments, where the core drivers of the, uh, of the capital into this industry. Now, there are several indicators that point out that there is the private wealth might be an important pocket for which private equity can reach. And I think that there are several initiatives that in the industries that are being taken to be able to fundraise through this broader uh, base of affluent, uh, affluent invest, private affluent investors. I would push back on the size of that industry and ability to raise significant amount of in quantities that we have been seeing from the pension fund, from the sovereign wealth fund. I think that the part that is most exciting to me here is the lengthening of the investment horizon of private equity. And this is a point that goes more toward a reinvention of what private equity does or expansion of the concept of private equity. Because private equity has been caught in this, uh, because of this illiquidity and because of the dominant structure of governance, which is this overlapping closed end funds of 10 years, it been effectively caught in pursuing initiatives that can be realized over four year horizon. Because if your average holding year period is five years and it takes about a year to exit, then by year four, you have to show some numbers, some effective results that are consistent and verifiable to be able to achieve an exit. And exit is an intrinsic part of the, uh, of the private equity. But by that, this has been an important but constrained optimization in this space of things that show up in four years, things that show result in four years. And arguably, the, if we think about it in an in unconstrained way, then, uh, then there is more for this sophisticated, agile, active asset class to do in a longer horizon. I would still argue for, for it to, to be more performance-based compensated than fee compensated, but, but this is something that I think uh, is an exciting opportunity. But uh, it's not been evolving so quickly, not surprisingly, because the liquidity still is an important constraint and with it comes the governance and how to overcome that governance. So lengthening of the investment horizon, exciting trend, I doubt that it will be fast enough for us to see the result of it upsetting any other macroeconomic trends. Final remark. Uh, 
the points that I already touched upon is the fact that uh, it's likely that a parallel response of what of this adverse trend will be further industry consolidation because slowdown of flow of capital into this industry is very clearly affect disproportionately new funds that will no longer see the poss possibility of raising large and larger fund versus a, a, a large fund. Uh, but in general, I think that they, my point still stands. Besides this consolidation of the industry, I think that uh, the different macroeconomic in environment against the context of mature, mature and competitive industry that can deliver return, but there's a no longer abundant alpha uh, in this industry uh, is something that um, will have to will be affected by the by the slowdown of flow of capital that uh, in a way that uh, will affect the way we think about the economics. Something that was on an earlier slide, uh, but I didn't mention it. It's hard, of course, we all here thinking about future and question is, is there an example? And I think that the closest example here is a little bit of what we've seen in fond of fond industry. Of course, there are many differences between fond of fond industry but uh, but still, what is similar is the slow moving nature of the fund of fund industry, and I think that the dynamic of in industry coming under crunch post financial crisis is something that is reflective of what private equity broader might be facing uh, in the future years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Victoria. So now we have a discussion. Um, by, by Gilles, so I just give the, the floor to Gilles. Uh, we already have some questions coming in the, in the Q&A. Please uh, use the Q&A to send your questions. After, after Gilles' discussion, I will, uh, we will uh, have an exchange with, uh, with Victoria and Gilles perhaps on, on these questions that are coming in. I also have some, but I'll, I'll give uh, priority to the ones that are coming in through the chat. So through the Q&A, not the chat. Uh, Gilles, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Hugo, and thank you, thank you, uh, Victoria, for for this uh, really interesting paper and and, and presentation. Um, um, I'm a member of you know the investment committee of of my firm, so believe you me, uh, it's the sort of things that you know ring a few bells for me. Uh, how to actually tackle this this industry and where it could go in the next uh, say five five to ten years. Um, I will start with the general comments. Um, which you, know, you did not tackle because it was not you know, the main point of your of your paper, and the nature of your paper, I would say. But uh, when I was preparing for for this discussion, uh, I did you know I'm I'm an economist by 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 training, so I did my usual stuff, which is to start with data. And what I found out is that there's actually not much <laughs> in terms of aggregate usable comparable data on an asset class which has literally exploded uh, the last 10 to 15 years. And it's always something which I find concerning. Uh, I understand that to some extent it's the nature of the beast. It's very, very hard actually to gather data on, on, on PE. You need to make you know, heroic uh, assumptions on the level of valuations and so, and so forth. But it is still, I think, a, an issue. It's a sort of a bit of a blind spot in, in the financial world. We have so much comparable aggregated data when it comes to equity and when it comes to, uh, uh, to bonds. We have uh, well, national financial accounts, flow of funds, et cetera, et cetera. We have not much when it comes to uh, P, which you know, I think is, 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 is troubling and problematic, especially if you think that the industry is just about to, to turn and to lose some of its, of its shine. It's precisely the moment where you would want actually to be able to have a sense of what it, what it means from a macro point of view. And uh, don't take this as, as a forecast at all, but reading, reading your paper, I was thinking of um, the last report I did when I was in the public service uh, in 2006, it was a BIS working group on mortgage finance in 2006. So, you know, two years before uh, things got a bit 
complicated for this segment of the market. So don't take this as a forecast. But I remember that you know my my first reaction was you no, know, where's the data? Uh, we are talking about a gigantic asset class, new asset class, and we don't have you no know, a quarter of information that we have on uh, uh, on let's say more traditional traditional assets. So you know, that's that's the first general point. On on your on on your narrative on your, on the story you tell. Um, um, it, I, I generally agree with with your points and with your conclusions. So I will just uh, make a few a few points here and there. First, um, the the impact of uh, of interest rates and whether or not we are basically at the bottom of what we could expect in terms of you know, further reduction in interest rates, and hence you know, a bit naturally. We should expect flows into this asset class to, to diminish. Uh, I, I would have, I would quibble with that uh, because what strikes me actually is that um, we are going to probably continue to live for the next you know, five, 10, 15 years in an environment where uh, market interest rates and risk-free interest rates are going to be incredibly low relative to what is going to be any sort of Vixelian uh, approach to uh, the equilibrium interest rates. You know, just to uh, I'll put a few figures here, um, if you believe the Fed's dot plots, uh, the long-term level of Fed funds rates should be around 2.5%. Um, the US economy's potential growth is routinely estimated to be at 1.75%. If the Fed one day manages to actually bring inflation uh, to two percent on trend, we would be talking about nominal GDP growth of three, three seventy-five, and the Fed itself works under the assumption that the long-term level for it, for the Fed funds uh, should be two and a half. So it's basically telling you that uh, there could be, for good reasons, in particular, the absolute necessity to keep debt sustainable. We could live for a very, very long time with the continuation of a divorce between uh, risk-free interest rates and uh, the sort of average return you would get in investing in the broader economy, which is normally what PE is about. So that should actually maintain a fairly high level of attractiveness for uh, the, the asset class in the sense that uh, I would see quite a lot of those long-term investors, those investors that you describe very well as, you know, they have those massive pools of long-term capital, they have long-term liabilities, they are looking for any sort of decent uh, returns, decent performance. Well, B might give you might give you that if you kind of throw the towel and believe that for the next 10, 15 years, you know, what you're going to make on traditional assets is going to be mediocre and certainly not enough to fill your your to to meet your your liability so um even if we've probably reached the bottom it doesn't mean that year in year out you're not going to continue to see a displacement of asset allocation towards uh pe it's probably going to be less spectacular than what we've had in the last five to ten years but there should still be some very, very decent flows, and I could easily see the uh, 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 the, the share of, of, of PE and allocation uh, rise. Um, my second point is about uh, the nature of the beast and and and, and the risk return complex of, of PE, uh, because as you as you as you show quite eloquently, uh, yeah, you know, returns are not particularly uh, uh, impressive. There are nothing to write home about. Um, but so is risk, or at least so far, so so has been risk. And uh, when I think about P, what I, I, I think makes it quite attractive, uh, including for investors, long-term investors, which are normally fairly adverse to risk, is the fact that it's a, a asset class which basically chooses the time profit crystallizes, which is very specific. If you are a, a fund manager, to a large extent, you will be able to kind of choose the moment when you actually realize your profit. 
uh, which to some extent is uh, an insurance against uh, volatility. Um, if you know that the fund manager is going to be, uh, the managing partner is going to be able to decide exactly the moment where basically cash is made, uh, that provides you, provides you quite sort of unique protection against, uh, against volatility. So that should continue to attract some, some, some interest. Uh, uh, but I agree that, you know, Otherwise, there's nothing to write home about in terms of, of, of returns. I really liked your points on on, on fees and you know, the fact that <laughs> it's uh, you could even think it's a sort of market failure in a way. You know, it's 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 an industry which is which normally should be fairly mature, and you would expect you know a level of competition that would have actually driven fees down and which have you know, as you say democratized the, the the industry and it it's not it's not it's not happened and um, i don't i'm not sure i have i have, I have an explanation why but um, the, the 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 i'm torn in the sense that i don't know if those mega funds that you described the the, the big beast in this industry um, on the one hand, you could say they could, to some extent, industrialize their process. They could actually uh, uh, generate some productivity gains uh, because they, have, they are big enough actually to do it, but they just don't want to. Uh, and they are basically capturing a rent there. But then the question becomes, if they are capturing a rent, why is it that uh, we don't see more disruptors coming up, and and that's the question that I I, I, I can't I can't you know get my head around. I have no answer, uh, but you would expect in this sort of industry to see some newcomers, some disruptors coming in and being just a bit less expensive, capturing just a bit less rent, and it's not happening. Is it because the nature of the beast makes it very complicated to launch a new venture because the level of capital that you need to you know, maintain at the beginning of your operation is so high that you, know, you cannot actually attract disruptors? Um, I, I, I don't know, but you know, for me, it's, it's, it's a big question mark on this, on this, on this, on this industry uh, and a big source of frustration, actually, I would say, as, as, as a professional. Um, and you know, yeah, basically that's 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 that that these are all my, my points. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gilles. So Victoria, we have a few questions coming in uh, through the QA. Uh, I can go over them, but if you wanna if you wanna if you have any quick reaction to what Gilles said, uh, go ahead. If not, we we'll go over the, the questions. On, uh, if it's okay, I, I was reading through the questions. I, they're really great and I'm looking forward to answering them. Uh, but I wanted to uh, thank Jill for a great comment. And uh, I, I two, two things. Uh, I mean, <laughs> we don't seem to disagree about much here. So uh, a clarification is that I don't expect industry to contract in its aggregate, right? Mm -hmm which is different from uh, what all I'm saying is that the growth rates have been, been seen in the past years are unsustainable. They, they're a product of something that is gone. Uh, you're absolutely right that he says that the interest rates stay uh, linger around zero. Next crisis, they escalate a little bit, next crisis comes around and bring it to zero again, just like we did in 2020. In that context, uh, they, return of the industry is stabilized. The risk, well, if anything, it can go in the opposite direction as we fine tune its measurement. We plug the scene in the way we normally think about the portfolio and it delivers us the same stable number. So it shouldn't be 2%, but once we hit about 10% of pension funds, so then around 10%, that's it. After that, it should continue growing at the speed of the growth of the pension assets, which is far from the, the growth rates that we've been seeing in the recent years. So the growth will be there as in the industry is very stable, but it's a growth of the stable industry versus the growth of the hyped up, hyped, hyped up industries that we've been seeing in the, in the recent years. 
As to why there are no disruptors, I think this is where the dis this is where the, uh, the problem is that what needs to be disrupted it's on the mega end, right? And that's uh, nearly impossible to do because you cannot jump to the multi-billion fund before you are on the smaller scale. And at the smaller scale, you kind of not operate, you need those fees to be able to sustain. And I think that, that that's where the scale, and look, I mean, there are economies of scale. A lot of the buyout firms use operational teams and whatnot that, that you cannot have in the smaller firms. So, so the inability to jump to that scale from scratch that that that, that is that's what's been uh, an impediment to me uh, to external disruption now we see regulators trying to disrupt this industry so we'll see how this works Hugo, uh, i'm happy to pick on questions or so follow your guidance however you prefer to do. I, I don't know maybe my, my i'll, I'll um... Let, let's start with anusha anusha, anusha chari from unc has two questions so uh, she has one about the impact of interest rate in cross-border into emerging markets. Right. So, uh, so I, and I'm curious if uh, Jill or uh, Pietro have other views, but uh, in private equity uh, and emerging markets, with exception of, uh, of Asia and China in particular, has been a very rocky affair, right? And that is because the industry needs to deliver 20% to justify its, its cost. And, and in the emerging markets, the problem is that they're exposed to, especially over this longer term cycles, they're exposed to fluctuation of the exchange rate. And the truth is that significant part of it is being eaten up by the uh, by these numbers, and so partly it's been ability to show the the returns on a necessary scale. There are many successful funds, but the question is, can the industry exist at the same scale the way it exists in Europe or US? And that's where uh, it's been hard to cross that barrier. And, uh, and I don't uh, anticipate that significant changes await in the, in the near future. DeFi has been a, a super important force of capital for emerging markets, not the private capital. And, uh, and the growth of what we've seen in emerging market, again, take out Asia, uh, has been largely driven uh, by the DeFi capital, more so than the private capital. I, I think this is uh, this is in a sense sobering, right? Because we, you know, especially being in Geneva, you go all these meetings and you think, you know, about leveraging private capital to to address the SDGs and 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 this view. I mean, at least on the private equity side, it's a bit, uh, you know, put some caution on, on this view, right? Um, so I don't know if you want me to pick um, some other question. Or if, uh, there is one that sort of uh, intrigues me a little bit because it's online of uh, something I wanted to ask you. Maybe I'll ask you this one by, by Gregory Brown. So, so, so Gregory is basically asking whether technological changes is affecting this sensitivity of, of uh, you know, uh, of of the industries to, to interest rates. So if things are different now as they were 10 years ago by because technology has changed. And, and this, if I can piggyback on this question on something, you know, when, when you were telling, you know, when you were talking about the fact that there is, uh, you know, some fixed costs for that, you know, you need funds which are large enough, but then you also have returns are decreasing with size. So you, you think there is some something concave that there is some sort of optimal size, right? And my question was whether technology has, has changed this optimal size, which I guess is related to, to the question that Gregory was asking. In my view, so, so you need, whenever you're op opining about some trend and its effect on private equity, you have to speak in differential terms. So, so you have to believe that there is something and it's uh, on operational front uh, that is happening within private equity industries that is different from, say, public companies, right? And again, to justify the cost of the industry. And, uh, and this is why I think it's important to separate two things, right? I mean, partly if you're talking about venture capital, 
Now, venture capital is uh, is very is something that clearly uh, has been affected by this, and to the degree that we are on a, on brink of pivotal technological innovation, venture capital is an industry that will benefit from it. When you talk about an aggregate industry, venture capital is not the major industry, major capital raiser in within a broader industry. Buyouts, this is where technological dif differences narrow down to the fact, can private equity implement them somehow better than a public company? And this is where I think that some credit needs to be given to private equity, but at the same time in such competitive industry, in a world with incredibly well compensated public CEOs, I doubt that this differential of the technology and its adaptation in the buyout space by private equity can somehow make it this industry that delivers us something that the public market is not. So venture capital, yes. Buyout space, distress, credit, I don't think so. I picked a few questions. So I let you pick a question that you like, Victoria. So there is a great question about infrastructure that repeats itself uh, through a couple of uh, uh, of, uh, of questions. I think that infrastructure is a fascinating area. Now we have to think about it differently. So and so the entire time I was talking about the fund industry, right? And the fund industry. This is where the dominant asset classes are buyout venture capital, gross equity, and more recently, private debt. Uh, so in that sense, could there be another pocket that we discover? Uh, so infrastructure in particular. So it's, it's definitely the case that infrastructure is projected to uh, grow uh, at the rate more substantial than, than it was that, that we've seen in the past. There is definitely more appetite for re the reasons that Jules outlined on the limited partner side for infrastructure segment. However, it's it's a completely different asset class. I mean, the professional who are deploying capital, venture capital, buyout and growth equity are not about to start taking on the infrastructure projects. They say, this is also not an active asset class in the sense that we think about what is the value add in a venture capital, growth equity or buyouts, right? So. Actually, infrastructure is something that is likely to be dominated by direct and co-investments than by the fund industry. It is a very good asset class for a large pension fund, for a large sovereign to, to take. That matches the liability horizon. It doesn't require much in-house infrastructure for managing those, this type of this project. So infrastructure is likely to grow. It is, my point still stands. It's not, uh, a lot of it is likely to be deployed directly, not through the fund industry. Moreover, it's not an asset class that you can interchange between, between traditional private equity strategies and, and the infrastructure. Okay, uh, I may ask uh, one more thing. <clears throat> now, um, I was uh, um, thinking these days, uh, what's inflation, the role of inflation on these, uh, in the sense that, uh, let's say, two years ago, I expected, of course, the, the low interest rates to end. I mean, in the sense, uh, um, because of basically the end of the pandemic, in the sense, we did expect everybody. But I, I was not expecting inflation in as much as uh, um, we have now. So um, what, on the one hand, inflation might also lead to negative real interest rates as happened uh, in the oh, in, in the 70s. In the sense. So that is a sense would, be full to, would lead to further uh, uh, tailwind. In some sense. So on the other hand, we know that there will be a reaction from uh, uh, monetary authorities. So how do you see it? So it, there is a part of the bucket of inflation and, and monetary policy response. And I actually, I think that uh, Jill's might have, uh, I'm sure they spent quite a bit of time thinking about this particular particular point. But I think I'm gonna concentrate on the part. Uh, and so there, I mean, the expectation is that to the degrees that inflation takes off and, uh, and we continue, continue not being able to control it, there is some positive cor correlation between starting to rise rates. Uh, for the industry, I think that there is a, twofold aspect here. 
One is again this element of uh, of how do we think about private equity with respect to other asset classes? What can it deliver in this my decision as a pension fund in this portfolio allocation that is differential from putting money into fixed income on equity, domestic or international, and private equity? The other aspect goes back to what I was saying. You have to think about. Can, is private equity differentially positioned to deal with inflation? So let's zoom on the buyout side and, uh, and think about as, as, if, as companies are being squeezed by the fact that they, uh, that they have to deal internally with inflation, is there something within how private equity run the companies that allows them to be more agile in adjusting into inflation environment? And I think that there is some truth to that. Uh, in the buyout, in particular, uh, one of the levers of value add is frequently renegotiation of prices with suppliers and more flexible supplier structure. If you think about, I think that one one of the of the like examples of private equity and their ability to adjust to inflation might be how private equity was dealing with energy prices in 2008, 2009. And because that was an important squeeze as well, right? And so this is uh, where we see that uh, they can be creative. They can, uh, they probably less squeeze than other companies, but still it's not something that pulls them apart sufficiently. It's this private nature and the, and the uh, active uh, approach does not help, but does not uh, pull them apart sufficiently from uh, the struggles that every other company will be facing in an inflationary environment. So that's that's my take. Can I just chip in? Um, I, I, I fully agree with, with the point Victoria was, was making on, I think you know, P being probably well positioned to deal with a, a more inflationary environment and uh, Victoria insisted on you know, renegotiating uh, contracts and, 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 and price rigidities. Um, I think there's a lot to say as well uh, on rest uh, restructuring. Um, assuming we end up in uh, proper inflation, not the sort of you know, mainly exogenous inflation we're dealing with right now, where it's a supply side issue. And yes, you know, what matters is to negotiate the proper price with your suppliers. But if we get into a proper inflation, endogenous with wages in particular starting, starting to, uh, to spiral out, a bit of, out of control, it's probably much easier to control this within uh, a restructuring than in a company uh, being already you know, public and uh, dealing with the day-to-day -day negotiations with unions and stuff. You know, a restructuring is precisely the moment where you can stop uh, uh, an inflationary spiral. Uh, it's not comfortable, it's quite ugly, uh, but we had actually episodes of that nature in the prehistory of this industry in the 1980s. Uh, and you had actually quite a lot of you know, success stories, so to speak, depending on <laughs> which side of the fence you, you, you're positioned. But it was, it was a big thing in the 80s, and it's something that could come back. Um, and I really think it's going to be easier. And um, coming back to my first point, um, I'm, I'm baffled, actually, by what's going on right now. It seems that in the US in particular, there's a sort of, Resistance threshold at two percent for the long-term risk-free interest rate. You know, we we get to two percent and boom, you know, we, we never get beyond that. Why inflation, um, you know, has, has exceeded five percent? Real rates at minus three. Now, I would not have thought about that as 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 a real possibility. This is going to make uh, uh, the search for solution, ensuring you against the inflation risk, extraordinarily appealing. And you don't have that many options. Um, and P might be an option. Okay. Uh, Just, yeah, uh, if it's, it's okay no. to, to add one quick Go comment. Uh, I think that whenever we also talk about active role, you have to also evaluate it with a perspective of a cost, right? So it is an expensive asset class. So I know it's, it's unambiguous that private equity has a lot of uh, 
it brings a lot of talent, they build expertise, they specialize. So there is a lot going on, but it comes with a significant cost. This is why I think if we just say, oh, this creates a lot of opportunities for turnaround, that's true. But it has to be the turnaround that justifies that cost. And this is why I like the, this disconnect jumps. So Ugo, if it's okay, I was going to jump on this question about uh, investment opportunities in Europe. And maybe actually uh, you, all, all of you are sitting in Europe, so maybe you, you might be better people to answering this. But um, it's, it's interesting. I, I mean, it's a question about, I, I don't think again, this is, this is, there is a differential between private equity and general growth, right? So, so I don't think that if you think about US versus Europe, uh, so okay, we are in both an environment that might be uh, that might be not well positioned to grow at some crazy rates, right? So, so develop economies. But still, I mean, uh, if I start differentiating between US and Europe, I think that things that start playing in are somewhat different in this how the private equity has been evolving. I think that the debt market has been slower to catch up. It's the fact that there are a lot of different jurisdictions and different bankruptcy laws under the same, even in the same currency zone. Uh, there are different labor practices and so on and so forth, as well as cultural elements, right, that make it more or less predisposed countries to uh, uh, founders or entrepreneurs to exit through private equity. So I, I don't necessarily think that it's about if we constrain it to U.S. and Europe, if uh, and with that we take out that we acknowledge that the developed economies that are not growing at at at, at high digits numbers, then within that context, I don't think it's the supply of the investment opportunities. It's more so this other factors that I uh, described that would explain why private equity growth in Europe has been different. But I'm curious about your opinions. So, so I think you, you, there are more frictions to, to you have these segmented markets with more friction. That's, that makes sense. I don't know anything about private equity, but it makes sense to me. I don't know. Okay. So maybe, um, so, so there is a question which is, so, so two questions. Um, one is about the role of foundations. I don't know if that's something from Rian Van, Van Gent. If so, so basically, is is uh, if there is space for the foundation, which in Europe, uh, according to the question of about 1.5 trillion of assets, to enter the private equity market in order to generate some, um, to preserve their capital. In fact, the question says not even to generate return. I I don't might not know it sufficiently about that, but my question would be, if anybody who wasn't from the macro perspective and anybody who didn't enter private equity by now like the forces of fixed income being dead as oftentimes some of the investors refer in this zero in zero rate environment and uh and relative attractiveness of the private equity as a result of that 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 kind of been out there for quite a while. So I'm wondering why uh, foundations might have been slow entering into this space. But if it's some institution, so I don't know the answer to that. And uh, and it's if it's some institutional factors that are likely to be. So to my indicated guess would be it sounds it sounds like they have already been living through a decade of uh, of of this risk return uh, distribution and they didn't make that move. So what held them back so far and how likely is it to change going forward? Uh, and it's hard for me to say from where I sit. I'll pick uh, one question from uh, Vrinda Mittal and I'm gonna rephrase the question a little bit. So, so you actually, uh, you, you, I think the report and, and your presentation explain very well the reason for this stickiness, if you want to call it, that there are these long cycles, so it, it takes a lot of time. But maybe my interpret, I, I don't want to put words in the mouth of, of the person who asked this question, but almost my interpretation 
that there is some uh, uh, less benign friction. It's like fund managers get to hang out with this uh, private investor and, you know, private equity people or, you know, something that has to do with market to market, which leads to the stickiness. I don't know if you have uh, any thought about that. I'm not sure if I would put it as a primary factor. Uh, it, it's a little bit of a conspiracy theory, right? <laughs> so, so this being suggested. That's what I thought when I read in the thing, but yeah. I don't want to you. And surely, and surely there, is, uh, there might be a little bit of an, uh, of an element of that. And again, I, I alluded to, to the books that I have that kind of dives into this. The, the, oh, the lack of structure for investing in the long term in, the, in long term on the limited partners uh, partner side. So I uh, I don't think that uh, that um, in I, I I guess I'm gonna take a, a view of uh, it might describe a few outliers, but I don't think that it describes the industry as overall nor can you describe the, it, it's also hard to come out with a story that would explain the behavior of pension, as well as defined benefit, defined contribution, uh, endowments, sovereign wealth funds. We would need some, some conspiracy theories that not, that not only negatively reflects on so many people who actually undercompensated and dedicated to maximizing returns. Uh, but also needs to generally explain behavior across the in institutional patterns. I, I tend to, I tend to uh, be more on the side of the intentions are good, but the structures uh, are the ones that make it make the lack of governance structures, the, the pressures that they are facing, and so on and so forth, is what is what makes um, makes it difficult to. Uh, to think about, to, start, to, to approach this asset class differently. And then of course, there is a simple fact that, okay, it's a liquid, even if I'm well-intentioned and well-informed. Once I decide to enter this asset class, I picked my phones, I did my best homework. On what ground am I gonna make decisions five years when they're raising new fund? And by the way, we already discussed that I'm gonna likely to commit money to the next fund when I raise the first fund, right? So there is no not much new information. It's a long-term asset, a liquid asset class. So I think that that is a really dominant uh, factor, more so than some some preference of uh, staying off the books. So, so there is one last question from Anusha. I think you implicitly already answered to it, which in a, is on interest rate normalization, but I don't know if you want to say something more about this, but my feeling that it was discussed already. Well, let me, um... uh, so so the, Anusha says, uh, how do you envisage slow moving P trends being impacted by imminent monetary policy normalization in light of the inflation debates? So I, I think that nothing, uh... The background between the returns being debated and it's not a clear cut and even those that believe that they can get into the top quartile are well being aware that persistence of performance of top quartile is not exactly guaranteed. Uh, so it's up and down. So uh, I think that that the fact that the fees has been something that is a sour point in the relationship between the LPs and GPs, the, uh, the, and some of the other practices more broadly. So the background is kind of, uh, it's, it's an industry that is uh, that not being keeping people super happy, let me put it this way. So now, the force that been pushing the capital and this desire of deploying the capital and scarcity and limits on allocation is what been fueling its uh, its kind of desire to invest uh, with a private equity. If in absence of a shock, it's kind of this background kind of can start slowly slowing down the flow of capital with a negative shock. So if all of a sudden the interest rate jump up very quickly, and there is a visibility in that they're gonna stay there. Jill's pointed out to the dot plot, that's not what we expect, by the way. So, but let's say that all of a sudden we somehow update about that. 
then that is actually only would precipitate because that you then can imagine the pension fund sitting down and saying, okay, it's time that we do our strategic planning 2030 and that that will uh, not play in the favor, favor of private equity. Right now, we're still acting on strategic plans 2020. And, uh, and so this is... Uh, uh, this is if if there is a shock, it's likely that it's gonna go in the opposite direction. And that oil tanker analogy is something that works works in both directions. It's something that had a positive momentum for quite a while. If the moment is missed and things start going in the opposite direction, I think that it's a little bit dangerous for the industry because it's not easy to undo it overnight. Okay, thank you, Victoria. Uh, Pietro. Uh... Let me just give you the floor to say, to close this since uh, you, you are the host. No, I mean, thanks to all of you. Thank to Hugo, thank Victoria, thank Gilles, thank all the participants. Also, I saw in the, uh, in the attendance list there were uh, um, at least two of our uh, colleagues, Ring Van Gent and uh, uh, Grande from the Bank of Italy. So one of the question of the foundation, so which our our uh, <clears throat> our peers in the scientific committee and also some of the sponsors, but uh, as well as all other participants. So I'm extremely thankful and happy for this endeavor and uh, Victoria in particular that uh, she has been extremely diligent and uh, timely and efficient uh, throughout. So thanks to CPR also, we have the report, hopefully will be the first of a long series. Thank you to everybody, bye-bye. Mm. Pietro, you sounded like Clinton towards the end of the first electoral campaign. <laughs> <laughs>